and your heart's clear, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to break in at verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God Himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you to the end that He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Father, we thank you again this morning for your word. We thank you for the Sunday school lesson this morning. We're glad that Jesus Christ has been that sufficient sacrifice, that one offering for sin. Lord, we, we realize today that we do not need other sacrifices. There are no other ways. God has provided an uttermost salvation for us. Help us this morning. We pray in this part of the service, give us wisdom and discernment. Give us inspiration and anointing to preach your word. And for all that you do for us, we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. My text this morning is the latter part of verse 10 and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now, if you read these two letters to the Thessalonians, you're going to say these are pretty good churches. This was a pretty good church. And uh, you would have to agree with that because Paul really has uh, very complimentary things to say about this young church. It was founded, if you read the book of Acts, Paul was kind of run out of Thessalonia after a very short period of time there. There were uh, new converts, there were people added to the faith, evidently a church was started. But Paul was not allowed to spend the amount of time that he probably felt like he would like to have spent there. <laughs> In order to get some people rooted and grounded and, and established in the way that he wanted them to be spiritually. And it was on his heart to do that. It was, it was ever in his mind that people would go on to perfection, that they would be saved and sanctified, that they would go on. And, and you know, that was the a primary message of the early church is to get you established, get your feet down. Get it where you can begin to grow and mature and develop and bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And it still ought to be the desire of the church to do that. It still ought to be the desire of every believer to get sanctified. It ought to be the desire of every sanctified person to grow in the Lord and in the knowledge of God. It ought to be the desire of every Christian to bring forth spiritual fruit. Amen? And Paul had this in his heart for this young church. I don't know if it probably wasn't a very big church, but it was a very good church. Even what I read to you in verse 6 there, it says, And Timothy came unto you, uh, from you unto us and brought good tidings of your faith and charity. And Paul commends them over and over through his two epistles to this church. But even in a church that he commends for their faith and for their charity for their willingness to suffer, for everything that they were going through, how that they were there. He also realized that in any church and in every church, there's various stages of growth, and there's one area that he wanted most of all to touch on, and he wanted to perfect that which was lacking in their faith. Flawed faith. I'd like us to look at that thought for just a moment or two this morning. What would it mean to have a flawed faith or have imperfections in your faith? 
I really like my little eSword program. If you don't have that little Bible program for your computer, if you use a computer, it is one of the greatest things about it is it has Noah Webster's dictionary in it. Not the other Webster, but Noah Webster. And I, I really think he should have, if he wasn't a preacher, he should have been a preacher. If he wasn't a theologian, he should have been a theologian. Listen to what his definition of faith is. He says, in theology, faith is the ascent of the mind or understanding to the truth of what God has revealed. Simple belief of the scriptures, of the being and perfections of God, and of the existence, character, and doctrines of Christ, founded on the testimony of the sacred writers, is called historical or speculative faith, a faith little distinguished from the belief or the existence in the achievements of Alexander or Caesar. Evangelical faith, justifying or saving faith, is the ascent of the mind to the truth of divine revelation on the authority of God's testimony, accompanied with a cordial ascent of the wheel or approbation of the heart, an entire confidence or trust in God's character and declarations. Now this reads like Wiley's theology. <laughs> It really does. I don't know all about Noah Webster, but I really like his dictionary. In the, it says, an entire confidence or trust in God's character and declaration and in the character and doctrines of Christ with an unreserved surrender of the will to his guidance and dependence on his merits for salvation. In other words, the firm belief of God's testimony and of the truth of the gospel which influences the will and leads to an entire reliance on Christ for salvation. I mean, that is powerful. That's faith. You believe God. There's been an act of the will that says you trust God. And in, 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 in harmony with a trust and a dependence on God, you've surrendered your life in obedience to God. It's faith. Faith that works. Evangelical faith. Justifying faith. Saving faith. You know, it's very important that we have faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is a very key factor. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Romans 10. He says faith of the gospel is that emotion of the mind which is called trust or confidence exercised toward the moral character of God and particularly toward the Savior Jesus Christ. We have been, as Paul said, persuaded. Old Agrippa, who said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You know what Paul's answer was? He said, Old Agrippa, listen, let me tell you, I would to God that you weren't just almost, <laughs> but that you were altogether persuaded, such as I am without these bonds. <laughs> the only thing, Agrippa, that I wished you didn't have was these chains, but I wish you could get a hold of a grip and a persuasion that God is who He says He is and He'll do what He says He'll do and you could have a saving faith in Jesus Christ. I would to God you had that. And the Apostle Paul wished that on everybody he met. A saving faith in Jesus Christ, a confidence, an ascent of the mind to the understanding of the truth that God has revealed, a belief in the Scriptures, a belief in God, and, and also uh, a surrender and a confidence and just a total giving ourselves to that truth that's been revealed in God's Word. Faith is also used in the Scripture in another context, just slightly different, but it's used as the system of beliefs itself. The object of belief 
a doctrine or system of doctrines believed, a system of revealed truth received by Christians. We call that the faith. We've been true to the faith. We have brought ourselves under the guidelines of the faith, and that is the system of beliefs that we embrace as Christians. And friend, I believe, I am a believer, but I believe this morning that every problem we face could be traced back either to a lack of trust or a lack of understanding in the faith system, the doctrine the truth of God's Word. I believe that every problem true Christians experience will either fall back to a lack of trust or a lack of understanding. Now think about that with me this morning as we, as we try to work through this a little bit. Failure to receive a definite promise from God will stem from either a lack of trust or a lack of understanding of knowing how to obtain that which God wants for us. You know, there might be people, there are people, let's face it, there are people out there this morning that are trying to get to God. There are people all around the world today that are trying to get to God. Some of them are killing animals and sacrifices this morning. And what they don't even realize is that many of them are sacrificing those things unto devils. The Bible teaches us that. There are people out there that are bowing down before a cow or an ant and they're worshiping someone's great grandma that was reincarnated, they think. There are people out there this morning that are trying to get to God through all kinds of rituals, all kinds of sacrifices. They may be on a pilgrimage to Mecca somewhere on their knees, but they are trying to get to God. And the reason why many of them never get to God is not that their sincerity was not there, not that they didn't want to get to God. It was because either trust was lacking in the right person or they were going about it the wrong way. And we're not as far off the mark as some of those people are this morning within our ranks here. But I want you to know if we don't approach God in God's way and if we don't appeal to God for the things He's promised in the biblical way, we won't get the answer we want. We've got to do it God's way. Let's think just a moment about a person wanting to get saved. The Bible tells us that it's not God's will that a single soul would be lost. That, does, that means that every individual in this room this morning can rest assured that Jesus wants you to be saved. We read John 3.16 and we've quoted it from the time many of you were children. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life this morning. It's not God's will that you be lost. You understand that this morning. God has made provision for you to be saved. And friend, if you have tried to get saved and haven't gotten saved, then there's a problem either with your trust in Christ or there's a problem in the way that you're going about it. The Bible tells us that there is a way that seemeth right unto man and if we go about it in our own way and in our own thinking, I'll get to God my own way. Preacher, I don't need this repentance. Preacher, I don't need to confess my sins at a public altar somewhere. I don't need to humble myself and bow the knee. Friend, you're going about it your way and you're not going about it God's way. The Bible teaches that every knee should bow and that every knee will bow one day. If you're too proud to humble yourself now, just think one of these days you'll get the privilege. But it won't avail you anything. You'll just be humbled by it. But this morning the Bible clearly gives us instructions in this matter of salvation. It plainly teaches us that except we repent, we'll all likewise perish. And if we repent, friend, we confess those sins and we turn from those sins to God in humility, in confession, not blaming someone else, not looking for the blame somewhere else. We take the blame for where we are. We take the blame for what we did. And we tell God we're sorry ourselves. We don't come to the priest and say, you ask God to forgive me for me. 
He's provided a, a salvation that you can appear before God yourself, you can appear before Christ yourself, you can confess your sin. But friend, until we're willing, willing to do it by the system of beliefs that the Bible teaches, we're not going to get the right answer. It's not going to work. And I believe that principle holds true with every problem we have in the Christian realm. We're either not doing it by the system of faith, the doctrines of the Bible, or we're not putting our trust in the one fully who has the power to meet these needs. Because see, God always keeps his promises. If he says he will save to the uttermost all them that come unto him by Jesus Christ, I believe that. If he says that he's given us power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, I believe that. He said, if they come unto him, I'll in no wise cast you out. I believe that. And friend, you can believe that. You can bank on that. You can put that in the bank spiritually. You can tell God, Lord, I'm here. And Lord, if I'm not getting the victory, I want to know why. And that's the reason Paul had it on his heart that there might be people in that early church who were not founded in the doctrines, who were not taught in the Scriptures, who would try to come in some other way and it wouldn't work, it wouldn't profit them. And friend, it doesn't today. And that's why God gives us preachers and teachers to instruct us in the Bible route. And the Bible route is true and the Bible route will avail. And if we'll do it God's way, it'll work. Salvation will work if you do it God's way. If you want to hang on to your sins, if you want to continue to hold on to sin with one hand and try to grip God with the other hand, the Bible tells us it won't work. But if you're ready to forsake your sin, and that's what the Bible says. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. He said, well, I'm just going to make out like I didn't do it. I'm just not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to put on a new face here. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. And friend, a sinner needs mercy. He needs to be forgiven. He needs to be pardoned. They need to be brought into the family of God. And this morning, if we do it God's way by humility and confession and genuine repentance, we can find true salvation by putting our faith in what He's told us to do and putting our trust in what Jesus has done as the only work that can provide eternal life. Then we can come to the right conclusion. We can come to the right end in this matter, but we're looking at a place and Paul was concerned that there might be people in this church at the <clears throat> Thessalonica where they were trying to do it some other way. He said, I'd like to be there to perfect that which is lacking in your faith, either in your trust and your ability to believe God or your ability to abide by the system of beliefs that he's laid down for us. And the same is true in sanctification. There are people that have tried to get sanctified. They've sought God. They've, they've seemingly been sincere in their quest for holiness. And for some reason or other, they've laid the quest aside. It's either a matter of your trust or it's a matter you're not seeking it in a biblical way. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. He gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey Him. Friend, we have to be born again into the family to receive and be a candidate. The Spirit is not sent to the world. The Spirit is sent to the church. Amen. The Spirit is not sent to sinners in, in, in sanctifying grace. The Spirit is sent to believers in sanctifying grace. Jesus said, I don't pray for the world as he prayed for the church in John chapter 17. He said, I sanctify myself that you also might be sanctified. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And friend, we can be sanctified this morning. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be a vessel that's been cleansed on the inside and filled with the Holy Spirit if we will trust the merits of what Jesus did outside the gate. And then put into effect the process that the Bible teaches to present yourself a living sacrifice, 
wholly acceptable unto God. Confess any carnal traits. Get down to doing it in a biblical way and do it with all your heart and do it with everything within you and make yourself a complete surrender to God. And God will do the work. He's promised, friend. And if you don't get sanctified, it's either because you have not followed through either with the desire and the faith that you need to do it or you haven't followed the biblical route and your faith is flawed. And when your faith is flawed, you do not get from God what you want. What did James say? He that doubteth is like a wave of the sea. Let that man not think that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He said, preacher, if I, <coughs> if I can't, if I can't have a hundred percent faith, you mean I can't get anything from God? It's not the size of our faith. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's the quality of our faith, the object of our faith, primarily. Our trust must be in Jesus alone. Every spiritual need that we have that is met is met by the merits of Jesus alone. It's met through the shed blood of Calvary. It's met through the broken body of Jesus Christ. It's met through His atoning work. And it's up to us to put our faith in that. But then there's usually a process whereby we get to the place where God can bestow upon us the thing that we're asking Him to bestow. And He, he tells us in salvation it's humility and confession and repentance and giving ourselves to Him. In sanctification, it's realizing that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and bringing ourself, our will, our mind, everything to be under total submission to the Spirit of the living God. And that's, that's so important. But what happens is, is that a failure on either one of these definitions of faith will produce a failure in obtaining the promise that we feel like God wants to give us. And Paul wanted them to be a recipient of the good things of God, just like every pastor wants his people to be a recipient. If I know God's got something for you, I want you to have it. If I know God's got something for me, I want it. Now, you want to be careful here of appropriating things that God has not appropriated, but there's... There are some things that are universal in scope, and that is salvation and sanctification. Both are universal. It's the will of God. It's undeniably what God wants for you, and He wants it for you now. You don't have to wait on it. All you have to do is get in line with the conditions that God lays down to receive it. But friends, when we don't do that, then it produces, it produces a level of people that are either heretics or apostates, because since it didn't work this way, they'll try another way, and they'll devise their own way, and they'll start a new church, and they'll start a new brand of religion, and they'll start a new denomination, because it didn't work that way for me, but over here I got a little peace of mind from doing it this way. My friend, we need to keep it right within the confines of this book, and not become uh, heretics, but if it doesn't produce a heretic, it sometimes produces infidels. People just throw their hands up and say, there's nothing to it. It didn't work for me. Well, I want you to know this morning, if you're talking about salvation or sanctification, if it didn't work for you, you haven't done it God's way. There's a flaw in your faith somewhere. But it does produce infidels. It does produce people that are skeptics, and it does produce people that have no confidence and friend, that's why it's so very important that when we set out to do something for God and get something for God, that we follow through with that. And it's very important that we get saved and stay saved. It's very important that we go on and get sanctified and stay sanctified. It's very important that when God gives us a definite work and calling, that we get busy pursuing that calling. Amen. Because this matter of having our faith flawed can be a very fatal problem can be a very fatal problem 
But I was thinking about another category this morning, and I'll try to be brief. But I was thinking about a believer. I'm talking about a sanctified believer this morning. I wonder, is it possible that sanctified believers could have faith that needs tweaked? Is there such a thing as a sanctified Christian that needs their faith perfected? Let me put it to you this way. Are you praising more or worrying more these days? Are you rejoicing more or fretting more these days? For you see, faith will help us to get over top of the circumstances. Faith will help us over top of the rough places. And folks, even sanctified people from time to time need to reevaluate whether they're leaning more on the arm of flesh or leaning more on Jesus Christ. And it's such a, it's such a, a subtle thing sometimes that it's such a subtle thing that we spend more time fearing what's going to happen than we do praying about the matter. Is that not true in some people's cases? I believe that every one of us this morning could stand that God would send some way and somehow to tweak and fine-tune and perfect the faith that we have our trust is not, uh, it's not affecting we had faith enough to get saved. We had saving faith. We put our trust in Jesus to save us. We had faith to believe that Jesus suffered without the gate to sanctify us with His own blood. We had sanctifying faith. But now in the cares of life and the battles and pressures of everyday life, do we have the faith that still leans and trusts and believes God? Nancy Davis wrote her song and said, I believe God in the midst of the circumstances, in the midst of the trials and through the battles and through the pressures, through the reversals and through the hard times, God is still trustworthy and my faith must ever be in Him to bring me through or to get me to the other side. You know, He's not going to bring us through everything. One of these days, something's going to take us home. There is a sickness unto death, and I don't say that you pray for it. But friends, something has to usher us into God's divine presence. And there's going to be a time in my life and in your life, if Jesus does not come first, that we're going to cross old chilly Jordan. We're going to stand at the banks and look over the old dark Jordan as the songwriters portrayed it. And we're going to look to see if there's a light on the other side. And that's when your faith is going to need to be intact. And, and the trust is going to need to be complete in Him. And the faith that you have is going to be in Jesus. And, and you've done it God's way. And you've done your best to search the Scriptures to see to it that you've lived the best you know how to live. And you've walked the best you know how to walk. And your faith at the end of the journey is going to carry you over one day into His presence. But without faith, you're not going to make it over. And if your faith has become shipwrecked and, and your faith has been destroyed and undermined and the thing that I see about the devil's tactics is he's not satisfied with just a little bit of your mind. He's not satisfied just a little bit of your allegiance or thought life. He, once he finds a launching pad, friends, there's no end to how far he's going to go with attacking you and whittling away at your faith, and whittling away at your trust in God, and whittling away at your walk with the Lord. And let me tell you, we need to keep our faith tuned. We need to keep our faith perfected this morning. Jesus wants to do that. And Paul wanted the Thessalonians. He said, I rejoice that God has done for you. He said, you are my rejoicing. I, I just praise God every time I think about the church at Thessalonica. I thank God about your charity and how you're benevolent and how you're giving your money away and how your faith is strong and how that you're pulling together and loving one another. And he said, I want you to love one another more and let that increase and abound more and more and more. And he said, I want to tell you that the end of this thing is, is that God's going to establish you and strengthen you unblameable in holiness one of these days. One of these days you're going to make it home. 
Friend, that's the goal. But in this world of care and pain and, and sin is becoming rampant in our society and it sometimes wears on our faith. Well, I believe God wants to do more than we're seeing Him do. And I want Him to increase my faith. And I want Him to perfect my faith. Where there are flaws in my faith, I want it corrected. And you know what? I believe God wants to correct it. I believe God wants to help us this morning. I believe He wants us to be fully persuaded of who He is and what He's all about. I believe He wants us to fully imbibe that system of faith that He's laid down for Christians to live by in the Word of God. I believe He wants us to fully abide by the Scriptures this morning. I believe that God wants to help us to conquer our foes and not be victims and not be defeated and not be downcast, but to let God help our faith to believe Him that through the circumstances... You know, I wonder what would have happened if the Apostle Paul had have gotten discouraged with the fact that God didn't heal his body. I wonder how many letters would not have been written. I wonder how many Roman guards would not have been converted. I wonder how many of Caesar's household would have went to hell had the Apostle Paul allowed the circumstances of his life and the fact that God did not see fit to take away every physical burden and infirmity would have stopped his ministry. The world would have been lacking much of the New Testament. <laughs> the church would have been lacking much of the epistles of the New Testament. He wrote those in prison when he wasn't getting out. He always looked to get out. He expected to get out. His faith was trusting in God. And friend, I believe we can believe God for miracles and ask God for miracles and expect miracles. And if God doesn't see fit to give them, that's not going to change our, our love for God, our belief in God. But if we don't ask Him for any, we're certainly not going to see any. If we don't believe Him for any, we're certainly not going to see any. But Paul saw miracle after miracle in his jail ministry, in his letter writing. He has, he has changed millions of lives down through the years because God used him in his circumstances. One of the best circumstances. Prisons weren't like they are today in America. Prisons were nasty places. Damp, cold, wet. Just hollowed out earthen sails most of the time. Some of them were facing the coast and the water when the waves come in and the tide come in. They said the prisoners got sprayed with the cold water from off the sea. What the nice cozy conditions we have in our jails? Wouldn't have been a very nice place to be put. But his faith was in Jesus. His faith was in the Word of God. And he endured that. And he persevered. And he followed through. And we would have thought that Paul would have gotten out of this thing on a chariot of fire. But instead his head rolled in a Roman guillotine. Folks, we don't know how it's going to end. But we know what the end is for the Christian. And our faith must rest in that this morning. Amen. Our faith must be firmly, firmly attached to what Jesus has done. And the victory is in our relationship, not our circumstances. The victory...